Hi, I'm Marie Ramo from Humble Bee and Me, and today I want to talk to you about DIY makeup formulation. We're going to begin by looking at the four essential characteristics that makeup and cosmetics need to have. So our first characteristic is coverage. So this is how much does the makeup cover the skin? How opaque is it? And the amount of coverage that we need varies by product. Something like concealer is obviously going to need quite a lot of coverage, or something like blush, less so. Our next characteristic is pigmentation. So how much color is there in the product? Is it as pigmented as it should be? We want something like a lipstick to be highly pigmented or an eyeliner, whereas something like a tinted lip balm is going to have less pigment. So it is worth noting that pigments are typically the most expensive ingredients in our cosmetics. So in inexpensive cosmetics, that's generally going to be where the brand is cutting their costs is with the pigment. So that is why Inexpensive cosmetics typically fall short on pigmentation. But yeah, different cosmetics have different degrees and levels of pigmentation that they require, and so that is an important consideration as well. Up next is adhesion. How well does it stay on your face? And does it stay on your face in the face of the wear challenges for the particular cosmetic. Something like a lipstick is going to have very different wear challenges and considerations than something like an eyeshadow or a blush. How long do you want it to wear? Does it need to be waterproof? These sorts of considerations. So adhesion is very, very important with makeup. Our next consideration is slip. Generally speaking, we want our makeup to feel nice as it goes on the skin. We, we usually use words like satiny or silky or very smooth when describing the slip that we want. I don't think anybody has ever said, gosh, I wish this lipstick were significantly more gritty. Sometimes slip is also an element of function. So if you think about something like an eyeshadow primer, typically when you apply the primer to the lid, it's very smooth when you initially apply it. But if you give it a moment and let it dry down, it'll start to have a little bit of tug to it. And that is part of the function of the product. That bit of tuggy grabbiness helps grab the eyeshadow that you're applying and hold it to the eyelid and then increase the wear time, improve the adhesion. So slip can also be an element of function. Up next, I want to talk about the different places that we put makeup and the different formats, the different types of makeup take, and the different challenges, formulation considerations associated with all of those things. So I'm gonna start by talking about eyes because eyes are a huge pain in the backside. Eyes are really, really delicate. The skin is delicate and very sensitive, and your eyes are very, very, very attentive to having things in them. If you get an eyelash in your eye, that is pretty much your number one priority no matter what else is going on in your life. You can be driving and you will still be thinking pretty hard about that eyelash that is stuck in your eye. So when we're thinking about this really sensitive eyes business, when it relates to makeup formulation, we're thinking about, okay, our makeup for our eyes needs to be really soft and silky. We want to make sure that it glides on over that delicate skin really beautifully. We don't want it to be tuggy or grabby and starting to tug at that delicate, fine skin. We also need to make sure that the ingredients are all eye safe. So some of the areas where you will encounter ingredients that are not eye safe are some glitters. So if you can get those really, really cool glitters for nail polish that are shaped like stars and squares with sharp edges, please don't put those in eye makeup. That can absolutely scratch and damage your eyes and be very, very uncomfortable or painful. Another area of non-eye safe ingredients are some pigments. So make sure you are checking with your supplier and with the regulations in the country in which you intend to sell to ensure that all the ingredients that you are using are eye safe. You will also want to be monitoring the pH of the ingredients in your eye products. Don't use anything with a fairly high or a fairly low pH because that can also be very irritating. In terms of adhesion, eyes are really, really annoying. They're oily and they move all the time and oil plus movement equals your makeup coming off. So eye products need to have a lot of ingredients to help boost adhesion and wear time so that they stay on your face and on your eyes and they don't move around and start creasing and start uh, transferring up into the socket of the eye. 
Next, we're going to talk about lips. So the biggest challenge with lips is how much we use them throughout the day. We are constantly licking our lips and talking and smiling and uh, eating and kissing. And so our lips get a lot of use. And so any lip product is going to need to be able to stand up to that use. So lip products need to be flexible. They need to be able to, to move with you throughout the day, but not so flexible that they kind of run around and kind of drip off the lips and whatnot. That's also not a great look. Lip products need to both taste and smell at least acceptable. You can definitely go well beyond acceptable by including things like flavor oils or butters like cocoa butter or essential oils, but it needs to be at least acceptable. Nobody wants to put on a lipstick that tastes awful no matter how good it looks. The ingredients you use need to be lip safe. So two areas where you will encounter non-lip safe ingredients that you might want to put into your cosmetics are preservatives. Many preservatives aren't lip safe, so make sure you are reading up on the preservatives you are using to ensure that they are. And some pigments are not approved for lip use. Ultramarine Blue, for instance, is not approved for lip use by the FDA, but is approved for lip use by the European Union. So there is some variation there, so make sure you are doing your homework and know what's what. And then of course there's that adhesion angle. The lip makeup needs to stay on throughout the challenges that you subject it to. Of course, generally speaking, very few things are completely infallible when it comes to a really big juicy burger, but nobody wants to be reapplying their lipstick every 20 minutes. So you definitely want to make sure that your formulation includes plenty of ingredients to give the lipstick the best chance that it has to stick around on your mouth for a good long time. Different lipsticks will have different requirements for pigmentation levels. Something like a lipstick is obviously going to require a lot more pigment than something like a lip tint. So that's something to consider based on the end product that you are aiming to create. Our last category is face, which is a lot easier than eyes and lips. Your biggest consideration with face is that it's a very large surface area. So color needs to be accurate, especially for something like a foundation. You need to make sure that it's a good match for your complexion because it's covering quite a large area and you will notice if it is not. Another thing to consider with that large surface area is the makeup needs to be comfortable. You don't want it to be too drying or too heavy or too tightening. Otherwise, you're not going to enjoy it because it's a lot of your face and if a lot of your face is uncomfortable, well, pretty much you're uncomfortable. Face products need to play well with others Face products are generally layered up quite a lot. You might have a primer and then your foundation and then concealer and then blush and then highlight. And if, as you are applying your concealer or your blush, the foundation starts to pill up and you start to have you know, skin colored eraser shavings falling off your face, um, you're not gonna be stoked about that. So make sure that your foundation and your blush and all of these things play well with the other elements of your makeup kit and of anybody's makeup kit so that there's that compatibility there because these products are never used in isolation. Different facial products will have different pigmentation needs. So something like a concealer is obviously going to need quite a lot more pigmentation and coverage than something like a blush or a highlighting powder, which is going to have lower coverage and lower pigmentation needs. The next thing we're going to chat about is the different formats that our cosmetics can take. The first one we'll talk about is powders, and that's because powders are everywhere. You'll probably be surprised to hear that powdered cosmetics are made mostly of large amounts of powder. And we blend these together with small amounts of liquid oils or silicones or butters to help weigh them down, give them improved skin feel, make them feel richer and improve slip. We tend to use powders all over our faces. They are rarer for lips, but I have seen some very cool looking lip powder products out of Asia that look like a lot of fun. Your biggest formulation with powder products is generally going to be slip. Many of the powders that we use don't have fantastic slip, especially when compared to creamier products. So you need to be making sure you are incorporating ingredients that create creamy feeling powders that don't feel dry or skitty when applied to the skin. Our next category is creamy cosmetics. So creamy cosmetics are very often many of the same powders that you'll find in a powdered cosmetic, but incorporated into a creamy base. So a creamy base is going to be something like a liquid oil or other liquid emollient that's generally thickened with something like a wax or a fatty thickener like stearic acid or cetyl alcohol. Because of the added oil in the cream cosmetic base, 
we have an additional wear challenge. Added oil creates adhesion and wear time challenges. So you will typically find large amounts of adhesion boosting and oil controlling ingredients in your cream cosmetics. We also use cream cosmetics all over the face. They tend to be more popular with people with drier skin or more mature skin. Our last category is liquid cosmetics. So liquid cosmetics are typically comprised mostly of volatile emollients. We need them to be volatile so that the product sets quickly. When it goes on as a thin liquid, if it stays a thin liquid, it becomes a mess on your face pretty quickly. So we need to make sure that the bulk of the product is quite volatile so it will evaporate off and set quickly. Liquid cosmetics also typically include film formers to further help extend the wear and the durability of the cosmetic once it is on your face. Liquid cosmetics also typically include larger amounts of film formers than you might find in other formats of cosmetics to help further strengthen that wear time and help the cosmetic stay on your face where you put it. Most of the formulation challenges associated with liquid cosmetics are associated with that dry down. We need them to dry down quickly, but we need them to also dry down relatively comfortably. As things dry, it can feel quite tight and drying, and that's typically not a desirable uh, skin feel for a cosmetic. So that's definitely a thing that you need to work to balance. I hope you enjoyed this video on some of the starter concepts to consider in DIY cosmetic formulation. Don't forget to check out other great videos in the HSCG video library.